WCLN 1170 Radio and Cable Channel 16 are pleased to present We Should Know, hosted by J.W. Simmons, an upbeat, informative look at people, places, and issues facing our community. This education-based analysis of issues will remain positive and informative as we consider closely what we should know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We Should Know is on there. I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm J.W. Simmons, your host. We look forward to seeing you each and every week on Tuesdays at 2.30. And also, there's a replay of the show at 7 p.m. Tuesday, Thursday on uh, Channel 16, Star Communication. And of course, WCLN is simulcast as our radio partner in this whole process. Today, we're talking with Mike Hodgson. Mike, uh, I want to thank you first for being here. I want to thank you for your work with the state of North Carolina. Uh, you've been involved in radio communications, emergency radio communications, a big part of your career. Yes, sir. Uh, right, your, sure. your journey here today and off air, you and I were talking about uh, a friend of a mutual friend of ours and a mutual friend of a lot of folks here in Sampson County. And uh, I'm, I would say I could give you the title Lieutenant Colonel. They wouldn't know that, but they would know the name Woody Sandy. Yes, sir. And, and they would understand that. And so I want to kind of bring his name into the picture as we open this. Uh, but the interesting part uh, is you were born in England. Yes, sir. Uh, you ended up over here in, uh, and ended up in North Carolina. It's an interesting story just telling us about that. But then the, the likelihood that you and a guy by the name of Woody Sandy uh, from the Rollsboro area in Sampson County came together and literally put together and moved forward a network called the Viper Network in North Carolina, which got accelerated with 9-11, and we just got through talking about that here in September 01, 9-11, what happened to World Trade Centers. I just want to turn it over to you and, and let you give us a history, not only with you and Woody and how critical that is, but your role as network manager, too, for the Viper system. You actually manage the Viper system yes, for sir. the state of North Carolina. This is very critical for everybody to know. So I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the microphone for the next few minutes. Okay, well, very good. Um, in, indeed, Woody Sandy and I, you know, have, have forged a relationship that goes back many many years. And I'll come back to Woody and, and really that role. Um, I came to North Carolina in 19, 1974. My father is a retired professor from NC State, came down here from Syracuse, New York. Originally, as you mentioned, I was born in England, as were my parents. And my father won a Fulbright scholarship that came, brought us to the United States. Uh, I was born in England and then came back uh, in the late 60s, Syracuse and ultimately to, to Raleigh, uh, where he taught at NC State. But I, I had the good fortune of having a next door neighbor that was involved in the fire service. Mm -hmm. and so. 14 years old, I started riding with him on fire calls as a volunteer and kind of got interested in that and interested in communications in the mm -hmm. fire service. So I go back a long way. I joined the fire department in the early 80s, and I'm coming up on my 40th year in the fire services in general. But obviously now I came to work for the patrol back in 1998, really with a purpose of trying to look at building a statewide communications network. And Viper wasn't even the acronym at that point. So turn the, the clock back maybe another three or four years. Back in the mid-90s, the legislature had a special crime session. I don't know what necessarily drove them to that, but one of the things that came out of it was that the state needed to improve two areas of communications. And the first one was to try to produce mobile data or mobile, um, you know, information into primarily law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And Woody Sandy was, uh, I think at that time, either a trooper or a line sergeant and part of the patrol's information management unit. And out of that grew a statewide mobile data network. And that at one point in time was the largest mobile data network in the entire world. It had a lot of users and, and it really brought to the head that the patrol could develop a network and manage it and grow it. 
and be the steward of that. A lot of times people say Viper or, or the old Siege and Mobile Data were the patrols. They were the patrols from the standpoint of we were the ones that the legislature asked to own and maintain it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future, but it's not the patrol's radio system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's everybody in the states. Going back to Woody and that, you know, that, that network grew, but there was also another component, which was to build a new statewide radio system. Mm -hmm. you know, the legislature statutorily says that the Highway Patrol will have a, a statewide radio system, but it was the old low band radio that we've had since the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And I tell people it was our sandbox. It was the patrol sandbox. Nobody else really played in that. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the country as a whole had significant ev events that proved that everybody having a stovepipe system didn't work. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if you look back to really two significant events prior to 9-11, really were uh, Columbine High School oh. and the bombing of the Alfred Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. If, if you look at those particular events and what they meant to communications and, and even to the overall incident command system that mm -hmm. we teach today, they, they are foundations of that. And, and when Woody and I were traveling the state many years ago, um, we use those as examples. So that's one reason why I mean, they, they're kind of near and dear to what what helped grow Viper from the beginning. In Columbine, Columbine is one of the largest high schools in the entire country, and it spanned two jurisdictions. So imagine that it was partly in the city of Clinton and partly in Sampson County. So when 911 calls began to come in from people calling from within the school, some went to the police department, some went to the sheriff's department. So people responded, disparate radio system, deputies couldn't talk to police officers, they had two separate radio systems. And when they got there, people said, you're looking for guys dressed in black carrying guns, because that was the description of the perpetrators. One came in one end of the building, one came in the other end of the building, and down the middle of the school was a long hallway. So literally, friendly fire exchange from deputies and police officers that when they peeped around the corner and looked down the hall, what did they see? Guys dressed in black carrying guns. What do what do tactical officers look like? Like when carrying guns. Yep. So, you know, that that was a, a key point that people said, how can we fix this? And you know, this group had an incident commander on their end, and this group had an incident commander on the other end of the building, per se. And until they meshed, there really wasn't a coordination between the two responding agencies. Now move forward to the Murrah building. So we, we all know that in the aftermath, we learned what happened. You park a rider truck full of diesel fuel and fertilizer and an ignition source, boom, you, mm -hmm. you blow up the, build, the building. Mm -hmm. So immediately when the response occurred, there were police officers, firefighters, federal agents that were located in the building that survived. Mm -hmm. Everybody was digging, not only to find colleagues and coworkers, but also the tragedy that there was a daycare in there and all the children that were killed. If you ever want to go and see a monument to that with the little chairs, um, that's a very moving thing to see and realize the impact. But once again, police officers had a radio system. Firefighters had a radio system. And guess what they had? They had two command posts, one for law enforcement, one for fire. And literally the way they handled information back and forth was to send a runner. Well, at some point in time during that event, the firefighters looked around and realized that the police officers had left. Sent somebody over on as a runner, what's going on? They said, oh, we've been told there's a secondary device. So now you need to evacuate. But it, it proved once again, no communication between you know, the, the disciplines that we would typically find in emergency response. So, 
all of that kind of set a framework that we need to do better. And now comes 9-11. And so when you look at 9-11 and you look at the players in that and, and the magnitude of that, and obviously, you know, Washington, D.C., the Pentagon, uh, you know, Flight 93 and and the World Trade Center, you know, flights, all of those brought different responders. So, you know, the, the, the World Trade Center was managed by the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, has their own law enforcement contingent separate from NYPD. FDNY is the primary fire and EMS responding agency. So you now had everybody with a different radio system. And you also had the impact, at least in New York, where the radio system had equipment on the World Trade Center. And so once you take that out, you had a loss of communications and, and that further exacerbated the whole situation. Pentagon, again, you think about all the agencies that surround the Pentagon. Where is it in terms of Washington, D.C., the Capitol Police, the counties that are around that, Fairfax and Alexandria PD and all that? Uh, once again, how do we all communicate? So when, you know, 9-11 happened, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security came around, and guess what? It turned on a tap of funds. So nationally, there was a, a bulk of funding. And one of the things that came out of 9-11, if you read the actual 9-11 report, came a buzzword. It's, it's you know an, an acronym that people latched onto, and that was interoperability. And that was key as the acronym for VIPER moved forward in, in trying to put that together. So now we really breathe life into interoperability and how would you accomplish that? So DHS, the Homeland Security people, they really sort of quantified different levels of interoperability. I can do it multiple ways. <clears throat> if you have a radio system and I have a radio system and I give you my radio and you give me your radio, we've now achieved a level of interoperability. So. You know, that, that kind of set the stage for the beginnings. Experiencing slow internet? If you have a fast internet package, the problem is most likely your wireless router. With more devices using Wi-Fi, your wireless router may not be able to deliver the speed and coverage you need. We now have the leading solution to enhance your internet experience. Using small devices in a mesh network, these Wi-Fi appliances cover just about any size home so that all your devices can operate to their fullest potential. Whole home Wi-Fi from Star Communications. Get the most out of your internet connection. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you for being with us today. We have a very interesting show. I want to ask you to go ahead and call a friend. Uh, tune in. You might want to hit the record button. This is something you really know, need to know a lot about. Uh, sometimes we don't talk enough about it, but we're talking with Mike Hoskins. Mike is the manager. He's a network manager, too, for the Viper system for the state of North Carolina. Uh, Mike, we when you gave us, you've been giving us kind of a historical update on what voice interoperability is. But the North Carolina Voice Interoperability Plan for Emergency Responders is, is a huge plan. So I want to pick up on that word interoperability. Historically, you, you really laid out for us the, the journey to get to where we are now, 9-11 uh, being a big part of that. So let's pick up from there, and I want, I want you to just kind of move that needle forward for us to better start understanding how this impacts every individual in the state of North Carolina. And the part that you alluded to, which is North Carolina took a leadership role with that, Absolutely. and you and Woody Sandy were part of that leadership role. Indeed, and, and, and going back to that, you know, out of all the events and the creation of that that interoperability need really drove the next steps. And we, I didn't write the acronym. I will tell you that two majors in the highway patrol, now retired Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lieutenant, retired Colonel Fletcher Clay and retired Major Pete White, they came up with the acronym and it included I. And it's like I tell people, there's no I in team, but there's an I in, in Viper and I is interoperability. Mm -hmm. So, as we drove forward with that, we traveled around the country, we looked at other states and what efforts they were doing and how could we best write a plan.
And that's really what the legislature asked us to do. Hey, we like your idea. We've given you the framework back in the mid 90s. Now it's time to turn it into a, a living document. So in November of 2004, Colonel Sandy and I and a, and a group of others that contributed to that, it certainly wasn't a, a two person effort, put together a plan and delivered it to the legislature. It said how much, we're, how much we were going to spend, what we were going to try and accomplish, a, a time frame to do that. And that really was the beginning. There had been some efforts to build some of the infrastructure before that. Um, we, we capitalized on some state uh, projects, Special Olympics back in 1999, some additional federal funding that had come through John Edwards when he was senator. But really, the, the bulk got moving in the 2003-2004 time frame to move forward. Homeland Security money was fl uh, flowing into the state. Mm -hmm. Then Crime Control and Public Safety Secretary Brian Beatty and coupled with uh, Linda Hayes, who was the chairwoman of the Governor's Crime Commission. Mm -hmm. They were early believers that we needed to funnel money and come up with a way to use this influx of federal funding to, to try to do large projects, things that would have an impact on all of emergency services across the entire state. Mm -hmm. So. That, that began in earnest, and I think in 2004, we had excess of $40 million of federal money to kickstart us. Mm -hmm. And the locals, uh, I, and I want to say that the second most important, if not even the most important word out of this, that we learned from building mobile data, and Colonel Sandy and that team learned, was building partnerships. So one, one of the things that I think you know, you have to have when you are, you know, building something and asking people to embrace it is they have to be your partner. Mm -hmm. And that's at all levels, the end users, the counties, the towns, the cities, um, the vendors, they all have to be a partner to your end goal, which implies ownership. That's, that's correct. And, you know, one of the things over the time, over time and history of Viper is that the infrastructure, it's like kind of like DOT. We build the highway and then you buy a car and you maintain it and you put gas in your car. It's the same concept with Viper. The infrastructure was built and paid for and, and a recurring you know, stipend comes from the legislature to fund it, but the end users buy radios. They buy mobiles and portables and that sort of thing, and they maintain, they maintain those themselves. We don't do that. That's not our, our job, but everybody has some skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Now, where the partnerships proved so beneficial is – you know, the Viper system infrastructure, towers and things like that, they weren't just sitting there ready for us to occupy. We've obviously built a lot of those over time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how would we have been able to do that? We'd either had to have bought property or the state owned property, or we had to have partners. Mm -hmm. So counties, cities said, hey, this is my dirt. You, you can use that. And so I'm giving you use of it, and in some cases, even ownership of it. And that's my skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we pride ourselves, that North Carolina is, is perhaps fundamentally different that from other states, and we kind of learned this in mobile data, was how do I make it easy for you to adopt? You know, I, we, we tell people we're not here to sell Viper, but we would we're building it and we would like you to use it as a resource. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did early on in our statewide tours of going out and meeting with the end users was what would prohibit you from joining? And the, the number one response was a user fee. So we said, OK, how could we do this without a user fee? And one of the biggest things was if, if maybe you have a tower, we could use that tower, or maybe you had a location that we could build a tower and we had a zero acquisition cost to get that. You are now a partner of ours. And that has always been what we have communicated back to the legislature. And of course, they, they have helped 
countless ways to get us where we are, but they have they don't really realize how much they help by not putting a user fee because the user fee limits people adopting it because if someone says, I can't afford it, and especially for your smaller rural so, departments, that's a huge piece. And, and that was how I think mobile data was so successful was there really wasn't a user fee. There was a DCI fee, but that's another piece that wasn't but, truly a fee. But that user fee uh, was actually the contribution of that local municipality of property or, or leasing of right. property or it's acquisition a set of, scales. of property. You contributed this and it offset something else. Absolutely. So if we were to go back and all of a sudden decide we're going to charge a user fee, we've always kind of joked. And this came up in our 2017 uh, program evaluation division, which is part of the legislature that kind of looks at success stories. Are we doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. Was they said, this is why you need to continue not charging a user fee because People will find a reason to charge you for what they're giving you. So there's no exactly. sense in just shuffling the money around. Yeah, exactly. So going back to, you know, the adoption of the plan and beginning to roll that out, you know, it, it was a, a heavy lift. Um, I, I think Secretary Beatty would say to you, he wasn't very popular for a while asking people to give their Homeland Security money back to the state mm -hmm. to build Viper. And there were early adopters, Sheriff and retired Sheriff Mac Manning in Pitt County would be a great example of somebody that said, I believe in this. And he became a spokesperson for us again early on to say, I convinced my commissioners that this was the right thing to do. And man, the, the, the horse was off and running mm -hmm. at that point. So, you know, over time, we have grown exponentially, you know. We, we've changed our technology in the history of Viper. We started out with one technology that really had a cap of about 65,000 users. And we hit that cap well into 2013, 14. So in 2014, the legislature gave us a, a huge influx of funds that allowed us to change the technology to a national standard. We now use what they call Project 25, which is a standardized digital system for radio systems. And we've grown and built onto that. We now have 152,000 users. You know, people ask me all the time, well, are y'all the, the largest? I don't really know because at the end of the day, it really doesn't have any factor on what we're doing. I just know that we built a, a ball field, we invited people to come play, and now they're playing on it. Define user for, for me, uh, 150,000. Is that individuals that can? That's, a user to us is someone who has a mobile radio or a portable radio. And uh, maybe this is a good time just to interject too, that it goes back to what I said about the patrol. Patrol maintains this, and yes, the state owns the infrastructure. But if you think about the patrol, 16, 1700 sworn members, mm -hmm. plus people like me that are a civilian, that we're a small agency. As far as 152,000, we represent just a tiny amount. So when you look at the entirety of this, this is owned by everyone. Mm -hmm. Everybody who uses the system and has a contribution to that is really a partner into its success. So there's and, a lot of municipal agencies that are users yes, that sir. are far more than exists with the highway patrol. Correct. I mean, all the hospital emergency departments in the state have a Viper radio in the ED or ER mm -hmm. or a regional health centers, mm -hmm. et cetera. Every ambulance in the state of North Carolina communicates to the hospital over Viper. And during the pandemic, that has been a huge, you know, key thing that has allowed OEMS has always been Office of Emergency Medical Services in the state and all the rescue squads and, and local partners, North Carolina Association of Rescue and EMS, huge supporters of us and have been a very good partner in us securing funding, communicating the message that this is what we, we need to do. So the Sheriff's Association, all of them are our key you know, users, representative agencies, and help us with our, you know, ongoing needs. Both large and small. Small, absolutely. Regardless of what, what the agency size is, they're all a, a contributor to that and to the success of Viper.
We, we're going to take a break. I want to go ahead and, and take this break, but I want to set it up, uh, uh, Mike, when we come back. Uh, as we talk about this, we're following a thread here that clearly you've laid out that we want to make sure we stay on to inform people that this is something that is engaging every community in the state of North Carolina. And we're going to be back in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. We wish you will stay with us and call a friend and stay tuned. We're going to get into the details and how it critically impacts you and your life. We'll be back in a moment. At Home or Away, knowing who is at your door is priceless. Star Communications is here to help with its doorbell security camera by Skybell. Live viewing and two-way audio equips you with the ability to always see and greet anyone that shows up at your door. If this is the kind of confidence you are looking for, call Star Communications today at 1-800-706-6538 to learn more about this intelligent security that you can always depend on. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. J.W. Simmons here, your host. The name of the show is We Should Know. We come to you each and every week. We want to thank you for being with us. We're talking about something that's referred to as the North Carolina Voice Interoperability Plan for emergency responders. And Mike Hoxton is with us. Mike, thank you so much for, for coming today. Uh, you are the state manager for the Viper system here in North Carolina. That's a right. lot of folks may not have heard that term. A lot of people listening or watching the show may say, well, how does this kind of impact our lives? When we went to break, we talked a bit about the huge number of users in the state. And you mentioned something I think that really opens the door. Uh, our hospital system, our emergency uh, departments at hospitals utilize this system along with all of our emergency responders. This is not just a law enforcement thing. No. This is a critical incident system that allows people to better serve every person in the state. I want you to kind of pick it up and, and continue your commentary on that. Going back to something I mentioned earlier when, when the U.S. Department of Homeland Security really kind of became came into being one of the things that they set forth was that there needed to be a, a communications group and they they set up a measurement of success at the state level to say how well are you doing in your state you know do you have two tin cans in the string or have you reached the pinnacle where you now have a unified radio system where everybody is on that and they live in their own world as long as, you know, police officers doing a traffic stop, firefighters fighting a house fire, EMS is pretending to a patient. But when they come together, even in, you know, agencies that require multiple disciplines, a motor vehicle accident, the ambulance, the fire truck and the police officer are all coming together. You know, how do you achieve that? And, and if you are achieving that with one radio system, with one device, and it's a sharing of groups of people, mm -hmm. that is what DHS considers the best that you can be. So if you look at what Viper set out to do and what we were trying to achieve, by God, we've achieved that. Mm -hmm. We now have a platform that allows us to have one radio and one system that gives you access to any of the emergency response disciplines yes like you mentioned we talked about the hospitals mm -hmm. sheriff's association sheriff's departments use the system every, believe it or not every one of the hundred counties and the eastern band of the cherokee indians they have some use of viper you know it's unfortunate that we have hurricanes in north carolina mm -hmm. so it's a, a an annual occurrence mm -hmm. well over the years we've had some bad ones so when the state mobilizes resources to go and assist the locals, you know, the locals are our first line of defense. They're going to go out there and make the assessments and say, this is what I need. I need the cavalry to come. Mm -hmm. The cavalry is coming on Viper. So we have, you know, talk groups that we use or, or, or channels kind of on the old radio analogy that we bring all kinds of disciplines together to bear on a problem. And so over time you know viper has grown and the more people that have it when i call on a resource and say hey i need you to come and help these people in brunswick county you may have somebody that comes with an ambulance strike force from forsyth county if they have a viper radio they now are not only able to turn to a channel 
in Forsyth County and gain situational awareness the whole time they're going to their ultimate destination. They can hear what's going on, come up with a game plan, coordinate with responders who are on the ground in the affected area because it's one system. So, you know, if, if you, and I hate to quote numbers because, you know, they change every day. Sure. So, you know, roughly 50 plus counties now use Viper as their primary radio system. There's a, probably a greater component even on law enforcement. Fire has a lot of pieces, moving pieces. Obviously, rural North Carolina still has a lot of volunteers, which is in itself a dying breed, but they rely so much on volunteers, it's a huge animal to bring to Viper. I mentioned earlier that uh, Governor's Crime Commission had helped fund grants in some mm -hmm. cases for law enforcement to join mobile data, join Viper, assistance to firefighters grants, which is part of FEMA, um, has allowed fire departments to join Viper. So every day that number of users goes up slightly. There's mm -hmm. always a growing number um, as, as more and more people adopt and join the system. So if, if you look at, you know, where have we managed to, to get to, the plan said we needed to build 241 tower sites that are all interconnected together to just like a cellular phone network. Mm -hmm. Viper uses a, a very similar topology to that. And, you know, we have almost reached that point. I think we're at about 235 sites now, and the remaining ones to hit, hit that 241 goal are on the table. We know where they're going to go, and they're in some part of the process. And that's been because of the legislature. Mm -hmm. The early sites were built, for, you know, Homeland Security, unfortunately, that funding, the further away we got from 9-11, the money has diminished. We've just celebrated the 20th anniversary. And it, it, it's, it's a sad fact that, you know, I have children that weren't alive on 9-11. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we have to continue to educate that. And we always say, you know, never forget. Unfortunately, there'll be another catastrophic event, whether it's man-made or Mother Nature does it. There'll be something that we remember in our lifetime and their lifetime where communications was important. And, the, you know, those are factors that continue to drive a need for Viper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the overall idea of a radio system where everybody can communicate is a, a huge thing. And it affects, you know, everyone. It, you know, if you have an emergency in Sampson County and Sampson County is on Viper, you know, you have to have it where it has to work mm -hmm. because the emergency responders are relying on it to do that. And and that's where we have grown the Viper team. You know, I, I'm one person and I think indeed Colonel Sandy and I were the architects, but there are people that do the, what I call the real work. Um, as a general rule, you know, they're the ones making everything happen on a day to day basis to make the system successful, keep it maintained. And obviously it has has to work in the worst of times you know it, it works when there's nothing happening mm -hmm. but when we have hurricanes especially in the eastern part of the state and it, it blows over your house we have to make sure that it didn't blow over the tower and, and and you know cause a loss of communications because that affects our ability to do our job and help the citizens and, and everyone in, in the state Tr truly this is as we're talking about this it strikes me this is this is that common thread uh, that service people use and service people are people that come to your aid in the worst times but this is the common thread they use to get to you find you check in with you respond to you transport you right. whatever that case may be whether it's a hurricane whether it's somebody broken in your house uh whatever it may be and, it, and it's now weaving, from what I hear you say, it's weaving more and more in the totality of our communities. Correct. And, and you, know, you know, obviously Viper has a, a hefty price tag to build it and maintain it. And, and in your larger metropolitan areas, they have systems in many cases that are almost like a mini version of Viper. So mm -hmm. they share the same radio, share the same type of technology. 
And they're very fortunate they have a tax base or a funding mechanism to do it on their own. But that doesn't mean that Viper doesn't still have a presence in those counties. And we're there to help them if they had a, a problem with their local system or if they just needed a greater footprint, you know, they can still transition over to Viper and use that. We have sheriff's example would be a good example, do prisoner transports. They may take them to one location and then move them to the, another across the state. They may use a local radio system that uses the same technology and devices as Viper. However, when they get outside their local footprint, they can now use Viper to extend that that range. And and that's something that, you know, I think the sheriffs recognize is is a huge benefit and they're a huge supporter. Then the North Carolina Sheriff's Association, North Carolina Association of Fire Chiefs, all of those people have a a huge uh, role in our success. If nothing more than a grassroots movement to help us when we have an agenda. Mm -hmm. You know, like I say, funding is a challenge and we need support for funding. And unfortunately, you know, it's it's like a puppy. It's gonna have vet bills and it's gotta be fed. So we always have those things that we need money for and having hometown heroes that help bring that message that this works, we're part of it and we and we need help, you know, to, to, to make sure that it's got longevity, that it continues on and it's maintained and supported. There's a, there's a sense here as you're talking, and, and I hear uh, a couple of words coming out. One of them is the importance of time and the importance of expectation. But sure. You guys, uh, in, in putting this together, uh, have set certain expectations that now the public has as it relates to that response. And as you pointed out, whether it's a helicopter coming from one of our major hospital systems to land in the middle of a road, or whether it's a response for one or more law enforcement people to a critical incident, that expectation has been put out there. And, and that's the thing I think that is, as we can discuss this going forward, is to talk a bit about those expectations. Right. And I think that's a, a, key, a key moniker in there, too, is that you know, we maintain the system, the state highway patrol and its staff, you know, part of my team, we're responsible for maintaining and ensuring that it works because we, we have an understanding that it's mission critical and that we have to, to make sure that the system is operational and what it takes to, to do that. We're going to take a break, take another break. We're going to come back. And I, I'd like to follow that and, and maybe uh, elaborate a bit more on the expectation piece, uh, what you see as the future, and any challenges going forward. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. We're talking about a Viper system, an inoperable radio, or operable radio communication system throughout the state of North Carolina. And we'll be back in a moment. You need to know this. To get the most out of your electronic devices, you need a strong internet connection and a protected home Wi-Fi network. You need high-speed internet from Star. Star has the fastest, most affordable high-speed internet service available for all your devices. We have no long-term contracts or high-pressure sales. Our service speaks for itself, and switching is hassle-free. We take care of everything with free installation from a local company. High-speed internet from Star. Internet at the speed of life. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're coming up on our last segment of the show today. I want to remind you that we come to you from Star Communications, Cable Channel 16. Also, we are simulcast, it's WCLN Radio out of Clinton, North Carolina. This show is also uploaded to social media platforms to so include Facebook, YouTube, and others. Uh, and later, once the show airs, once you see us on the TV side, you can also pick it up. If you, if you need to call a friend, say, hey, take a look at this in New York, New Zealand, or wherever they may Maybe you can do that because it's going to be on the social media platforms. We've been talking today about a critical uh, part of uh, a program that impacts your life each and every day. And we've been talking with Mike Hodgson. Mike, uh, you are the manager for the Viper system for the state of North Carolina. And that voice interoperability plan for emergency responders uh, is what Viper is. It's, a, it's an acronym. But as you pointed out, uh, it impacts everybody's life. I want to kind of move forward uh, to some degree to make sure folks understand that that what you and your team and others over the history that you talked about has put together has become an expectation. Oftentimes there's things that happen that's in place 
for us as citizens that happens. And we, I'm not going to say we take for granted, but if, if it's not there, it becomes a critical infrastructure flaw. So help us understand what we need to do locally to assure through our necessary um, political folks that are there to help us through our leadership locally to make sure and assure that this system holds strong. Right. Uh, JW, I, th I think, you know, I, I certainly would be remiss if I didn't really harp on my team because, you know, the, the job that the people we as Viper serve, the emergency responders, and like I say, and that's not just troopers, um, it's, it's everyone that makes up the emergency response. Um, you know, our mission is ourselves is a mission critical, you know, piece of that. So our employees, they take their jobs very, very seriously because if the system isn't there and doesn't work, then the emergency responders are you know, impacted and may be unable to effectively do their job. So, you know, we, we have a team and that team has grown over the years and, and we do all sorts of things. You know, I think a lot of people maybe don't understand that, you know, it's, it's a network of towers. Every tower has a building, it has light bulbs in it, it has a generator, it has air conditioning, it has, you know, entrance, uh, you know, controls, et cetera. All of those are monitored by people and all of those are maintained by people. So we have people that cut grass, we have people that fix generators, we have radio technicians, we have a 24 hour network operations center that's staffed with people that look at every aspect. They look at big TV screens and they look at alarms and all the traffic that's on the system that represents those emergency responders. And you know, as the system grows, our need for more people grows. And those are, you know, certainly in, in part of our ongoing challenges is making sure that we have funding to hire more people as they're needed and, you know, add uh, capabilities to our team because our team in the background is supporting those emergency responders. Um, in, you know, every time, you know, I, I realize that going back to my vet bill and, and food analogy is as the system grows, it costs money. Nothing is free. You know, that's, there's no such thing as free lunch. And, you know, you've got to invest money in that. And the legislature has been very, very supportive. Not only are there capital needs, technology needs refreshing. Um, Right this this year alone, we have the what we use to connect the sites together. We use microwave radios. Looks like big dishes that are on towers. We're at a point now where we're 20 years into some of that technology, uh, and it's time for a refresh. So the legislature helps us with capital funding to do that. It, it's not huge bites every year, but it's periodic years mm -hmm. that we need to do that, and obviously. You know, as the system has grown bigger and bigger and bigger, and we've reached that 241 site goal, more and more and more equipment has to be maintained. So, you know, we, we go back and we ask for, you know, recurring money or additional recurring funds, additional positions. And that's really where those grassroots people you mentioned the, mm -hmm. the, pol the politics of it. Um, I, don't, I don't like to politicize things, but it's it certainly helps because, mm -hmm. you know, let's face it. Your, the constituents for the legislators live in your community, my community, and all the communities, and they can be the ones in some cases that communicate most effectively. I can come from Raleigh and tell you something, but if somebody at the local level says, this is important to me, and I need you to help support this because I use this and this is the mechanism that I serve my public, then that's a, a message that a thousand voices is a whole lot stronger at communicating than just one or two. And, and I think that's been, been part of our overall success has been that, that people have preached the message, if you want to call it that, and said, this is important to do. You know, as as we go forward, you know, our, our country changes. We just celebrated 20 years of 9-11. And, and you look at the things that have changed in the last two or three years and dynamics and what our emergency responders encounter now. It's always changing. You know, back when I joined the fire department and, and EMS and things like that, 
there were only three people. There were three components to the emergency services, EMS, fire, and law enforcement. Wow. You know, nowadays we could have a public health emergency of some sort. The pandemic mm -hmm. is a perfect example of that, that those public health professionals now have a role in caring, quarantining, managing, you know, large scale impacts to the general public. And in some cases, that could be food delivery, mm -hmm. agriculture, you know, agricultural food safety. So the, the public safety mantra has grown over time to include a lot of other people. I'll never forget, we had a hurricane once and they said the building inspectors need to be on Viper. Mm -hmm. And I said, explain that to me. And they said, well, the buildings have been condemned because of damage in the storm. So they need to go out and work with our emergency services people to determine whether the buildings are safe to reoccupy. I said, hey, never thought about that. But it goes to show that things change over time. Mm -hmm. You know, the last several years, uh, nation, nationally and in, in North Carolina as well, civil unrest has, has risen. And that has brought a new challenge to Viper and, and to emergency responders as a whole. You know, it started with um, protecting information in HIPAA. You know, you go to the doctor now, there's a whole different ball game than it was 20 years ago, I could have an open conversation with somebody about a patient. Mm -hmm. Now it's a much more narrow scope. Mm -hmm. And and once again, you know, you get into protecting information, but also protecting the people that are using that information. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're really seeing now as a focus and, and Viper's having to adapt and change to that is the use of encryption. Um, you would think, hey, what, what is encryption? Well, believe it or not, everything we do every day has encryption in it. When we send an email, it's encrypted so that on the far end, it's decrypted. The same thing applies to our radio system and how it's used. And a lot of people would say, well, that's just for cops. So that's just for law enforcement. They're the ones that, you know, they're out there in civil unrest. But imagine transmitting patient information over Viper to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Is if, if I say your name, J.W. Simmons, or your date of birth, mm -hmm. you know, the wrong people can assemble that and... Now, all of a sudden, you've got a credit card shows up in your name at your house that you never applied for because they uh, they were able to capture a piece of information that typically you wouldn't have done. In, in Again, in our law enforcement component responding to civil unrest, we found this occurred in Raleigh, Charlotte, and even in other places in North Carolina, they're outflanked by the protesters. And so now the safety of our responders is in jeopardy. So how do you solve that? We have a great radio system. We have a way to communicate it to them. But now if someone else is listening, they have the same information that the emergency responders do. And so we're having to adapt to that. And that's one of, other than funding and things like that as Viper moves forward, that's a new challenge for Viper. How would we do that? Because believe it or not, going back to that very key word, I, interoperability in Viper, encrypting things now means that's another level of sharing of information that you and I may need to have but it also has a tendency to prohibit others that might really need to be part of the conversation. So we have to do a, a very careful balance. Or are we hurting interoperability in the name of improving officer safety? And that's a challenge that we're, we're really relatively new. We, we, you know, we're rising to that challenge, but how to, to, to make that work. Uh, as as you've been talking today, and I, it just struck me, uh, and you mentioned something. I don't know whether I mentioned this up front or not, but if not, I'm going to mention it again. If I didn't, uh, you have a degree in mechanical engineering, and, and it certainly comes through in your analytics and understanding the details of it. Uh, uh, a mechanical engineer is going to understand and know things on a granular level that typically a lot of other folks are not going to know because you're going to see things that a lot of folks don't right. see. Sometimes that's a flaw for me because <laughs> I could go down rabbit trails and talk for a very long time on, on a particular thing. But I think Colonel Sandy would say this too if he were here today, and, 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 and certainly there are others. You know, 
I have a passion for this, that, that I want it to succeed and I want it to be all that it can be. And and I will tell you that, you know, I would say of my team, you know, when things happen when as they do, you know, we shine under the worst of circumstances. And I think that's true for a lot of people in the emergency services community. When things go wrong, we rise to the challenge and step up to that. I want to thank you for being with us today, Mike. And uh, it's, it's been an exceptional uh, program today. I hope folks grasp. I, I'm going to go ahead and invite you back at some point in time. Yes, but sir. we got to go to close. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for being with us today. We've been talking about the state voice interoperability plan for emergency responders. Critical to you. We look forward to your continued input. We look forward to seeing you again next time. And may God bless. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion regarding this or any episode, please send your emails to we should know edu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.